Hello and good afternoon to this third Eurotech webinar, this time on the future competences of the engineer. Your host is uh, the Danish Technical University, DTU. My name is Ulla Gade Biskov, and I'll be your host for the next one and a half hour. Um, as you noticed from the invitation, we are inviting you um, to come with us on a journey this afternoon uh, to look at the future competences of the engineer. We know the engineer is playing a vital part in solving and addressing the big solutions in society today. But we also need to look at to what extent the engineer masters the competences that are sought after by both industry and society. Uh, at DTU, we believe that interdisciplinarity, innovation, and especially collaboration um, are indispensable as part of the modern competences of the engineer today. Um, and in this webinar, we will investigate um, what the competences are that we need to teach, how they are being learned by the students and how they come to play uh, in the fast developing labor market today. Uh, you learn about the latest research in the field. And to this purpose, we have put together a panel for you that consists of, of five different speakers. We have a dean with us. We have two associate professors, a research assistant and a student representative. Uh, and they will all address the so-called soft skills or soft competences um, <laughs> that here at DTU we are trying to put to play in uh, the engineering educations. So um, that being said, uh, I will go to a more formal uh, welcome by our Dean, Philip Binning, who is uh, the Dean of Graduate Studies at DTU and also of International Affairs. Welcome. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ulra, and uh, it's great to uh, see you all here in this uh, virtual seminar. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, just spend a few minutes uh, talking to you about the uh, context uh, for today's uh, seminar. Um, we're just uh, having a few problems with the slide here. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the context of uh, today's seminar. Um, and uh, uh, to do that, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, institution where we're sending from, DTU, uh, and then uh, a little bit about Eurotech uh, and about uh, the uh, competence, the idea of engineering competences. Uh, what is it that we're doing with it? Mm -hmm. So uh, a little bit about uh, DTU just to uh, get us started. Um, so uh, DTU is a technical university in uh, Denmark and we are uh, one of uh, the uh, members of the uh, Eurotech um, uh, Alliance uh, that is uh, producing engineering education uh, for Europe. Um, and uh, if we look at uh, DTU, uh, we have a strategy that uh, says uh, three things. We want to offer uh, Europe's best engineering education. And this is a little bit of a provocative thing to say in a European uh, project with other universities. But uh, what we mean by this is that uh, we're going to work uh, together with the top technical universities in Europe to deliver Europe's best engineering education. Uh, and then uh, we're going to uh, address uh, sustainable change uh, and we're going to assume the leadership uh, opportunities offered by uh, digitalization. It's a very simple strategy. It says three things. And if you think about it, it also says something about uh, what sort of competences uh, engineers need for the future. Uh, they need to be well-educated, they need to address uh, sustainability, and they need to be ready for a digital world. Uh, DTU is uh, one of the uh, universities in the uh, Eurotech Alliance, and you can see on this uh, slide the other universities, um, and there are uh, uh, a bunch of us here, uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands, uh, Ecole Polytechnique in France, uh, TU Munich in Germany, uh, the Czech Technical University in Prague, and uh, Taltec uh, in Estonia. 
uh, welcome to all of you. And then we have uh, two associate members, uh, and that is um, Eco Polytechnique Federal Lausanne, um, and that's in Switzerland, and uh, Technion uh, in Israel. Uh, so we are together uh, Eurotech. Uh, and we have uh, in our uh, um, Eurotech Alliance, we have uh, these universities, and then we have uh, 45 associated partners. Uh, and the idea there is uh, to work with uh, some of the uh, partners that are going to uh, help us define engineering education in the future, industry partners. Uh, and uh, that's the topic for today, is to talk about what competences you actually uh, need for a future uh, engineer. Uh, a little bit about uh, Eurotech, so you uh, understand the uh, context for uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Eurotech um, is a project uh, that is intended to uh, deliver the future uh, engineering education. And uh, we, uh, the universities, uh, believe that uh, that uh, uh, education of the future can't be delivered by a single institution uh, by itself, that we actually need to get together with other universities to uh, put together the high quality engineering education that we uh, uh, want to deliver, and that's uh, uh, Eurotech. So uh, the first uh, uh, aim of Eurotech is to uh, build the Eurotech uh, campus uh, to give uh, students, vocational and lifelong learners access to our six partner universities. Uh, and this statement is uh, important because uh, it actually says uh, something about the way we want to educate. Um, we don't want to uh, do what uh, universities traditionally do, and that is uh, teach uh, the young people. Uh, we also want to uh, reach out uh, to uh, people in other disciplines and provide uh, vocational training. Uh, and we want to uh, also work with our graduates and others after they've uh, left the university to uh, upskill them uh, in, uh, uh, throughout their life. Um, so uh, this fits very well in the topic of today's seminar, which is all about uh, engineering competences, because uh, uh, in order to be able to do that successfully, we all, of course, have to be very aware of uh, what type of uh, competences engineers actually need. Um, that's uh, one aspect of Eurotech. There are a couple of others. Uh, there's the Eurotech Collider, uh, and this is where we bring uh, all of these uh, actors together with uh, industry to address the uh, challenges and co-create the solutions uh, of the challenges to the 21st century. Then there's uh, defining the Eurotech professional, uh, and this is where we want to actually work, uh, and this is the topic that's directly related to uh, today's seminar. This is uh, discussing those future uh, engineering uh, competences. And the reason the seminar is being uh, sent from DTU is because uh, uh, DTU is actually uh, responsible for uh, this part of uh, the Eurotech uh, project. Then there is uh, the Eurotech uh, connector, uh, and this is where we uh, analyze what we do uh, and we reach out uh, to uh, other uh, professions and bring uh, those ideas back into, uh, into the uh, project. Uh, and then the last uh, part is, uh, is uh, communication. So uh, that's the Eurotech uh, project. Uh, let's just uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the competences of the future. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, the Technical University of uh, Munich has uh, thought a little bit about, um, and uh, they have uh, worked with uh, competences and defined them uh, in three different categories. There are personal competences, social communicative competences, and technological methodological competences. Uh, and an engineer, if you like, is the union between these three spheres of competencies. Uh, and they've uh, explained that a little more in a little more uh, detail here uh, by um, describing uh, in uh, some more uh, in some more detail about uh, what is meant by uh, technological and methodological competences and so on. Uh, and part of this uh, is uh, uh, in some ways uh, obvious. Um, an engineer, uh, of course should be uh, well-founded in the digital world. So they should be able to work with uh, data. Uh, they should be able to work with software, artificial intelligence, modeling, these sorts of things. Um, and uh, uh, they also need uh, 
uh, social and communicative competences and personal competences. Um, and it's uh, very nice uh, to see uh, the way that they've been uh, defined uh, here. Um, uh, and you can see uh, that uh, um, uh, the engineer needs uh, both the technical skills uh, and these uh, personal and social communicative competences. And the place where these things, three things meet, that's where the uh, engineer uh, works and operates. Uh, and that's where project management, uh, management systems thinking and problem solving uh, comes into play. Um, and uh, when we're uh, looking at uh, today's uh, seminar, then uh, we've uh, tried to uh, uh, place it um, uh, and uh, bring some interesting topics in that uh, help you uh, understand how these uh, competences might be addressed in an educational context. And we've specifically chosen to focus on uh, uh, the development of innovation skills, which is really uh, uh, centered uh, in the middle of this figure where you see the problem solving, the systems manage, systems thinking. Uh, and it also brings uh, into play the personal and social communicative competences through um, an entrepreneurial mind mindset, uh, innovative thinking, communication, social awareness, uh, collaboration. And then, of course, uh, being engineers, we are founded uh, in our technological and uh, methodological competences. So you can look forward to uh, hearing about our innovation in engineering course, where we try to bring uh, these things together. Now, uh, this is a uh, inwards looking uh, out uh, perspective. That's to say, uh, this is uh, an academic uh, view of, uh, of the competences. It's uh, interesting perhaps also to uh, think about uh, how industry might uh, look at uh, future competences. And that's uh, something that we've also done in this project. Uh, and you can see uh, on this slide here, um, uh, when we've asked industry, and uh, we've done that across the uh, countries that uh, we've been, uh, that are part of the uh, Eurotech Alliance, we've asked them uh, what, are, what are the important uh, skills uh, and competences for engineers. Uh, and they uh, came up with uh, this nice uh, set of uh, 21 uh, future competence uh, areas. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know how good your memory is, but um, uh, if you look at this, you can see uh, that uh, this uh, includes uh, many of the same uh, um, topic uh, headings, if you like, um, uh, and uh, it includes uh, all three of these uh, spheres of, uh, of uh, engineering competences, core engineering competences that uh, we as universities uh, uh, identified for ourselves. So you see the hardcore stuff like the uh, data science um, and uh, uh, the modeling skills, the software knowledge. You see the social skills like um, uh, the uh, self-awareness, the emotional intelligence, um, and, uh, and then you see the communicative uh, skills uh, coming in uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and then the, of course, the things that are in the core of uh, engineering, uh, the problem solving skills are all uh, here amongst the uh, future competence areas. So that's very nice. Uh, we have a, a nice alignment between what industry thinks an engineer should do and what uh, we as uh, universities uh, think we should do. So uh, these are outcomes from the project. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, leave you at this point and hand you over to uh, uh, the next speaker who's uh, Yap. Dalhousian, and he's going to tell you about uh, innovative and collaborative comp competences uh, for engineers and uh, how uh, to develop them uh, in a university. Uh, and I think, uh, I hope you uh, really enjoy uh, the talk uh, because uh, that will make uh, some of these uh, perhaps a little bit uh, fluffy things that I've introduced uh, a little bit more uh, concrete. So uh, thanks very much. Hello again. Let me just jump in quickly before Jaap takes the floor. I um, actually was supposed to mention to you before that this uh, webinar is, of course, it's live streamed, um, but it's also uh, being recorded and it will be published after this session. So you can find it online on the Eurotech uh, different uh, channels afterwards. And you are welcome along uh, the, the speakers here to start posting. If you have any questions, please direct them. Uh, clearly to a speaker if you are asking a specific speaker and we will collect them 
And after the Q and, and when the Q&A session starts, you have to end uh, writing your questions. Thank you very much. And I'll give the floor to Jav Dahlhuis. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for, for joining. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this rather um, ambitious course that, that the GU has designed, uh, decided to develop a couple of years ago. Um, so let me jump in, into that. So as, as uh, Philip Binning already uh, said, this, is, this, co this course is called Innovation Engineering, and the, the whole aim was to offer innovate, innovative competencies to all of the uh, master students at DTU, which is about two and a half thousand a year. So next to kind of thinking about how should we offer innovation uh, and collaboration competences to engineers in general, we also had to think about how to do this at, at, a, at a large scale uh, that, was, that we had to deal with. So that's what I'm going to... Uh, Kind of talk you through. I, I will kind of talk about the different features that we uh, that are kind of key in, in developing this this course. It's actually two courses. I'll get back to that. Um, so I hope you bear with me. I'll just first briefly introduce myself, so you know where I'm coming from. So my name is uh, uh, Jaap Dijsen. Uh, I did my training and PhD at TU Delft. I am Dutch, and then I moved to DTU. Uh, now an associate professor here in, in design methodology. Um, I've also been leading the design program for quite a few years here at DTU, uh, where we teach these kind of design and innovation competencies in depth to a smaller group of students. Um, but as I said, in, in, in the past few years, and mostly in 2020-21, uh, DTU decided to develop this large-scale program for all of our master students on design uh, or in a, on innovation and on cross-disciplinary collaboration. The starting points for, for this course um, is where we kind of need to start here. So basically the belief behind this decision is that, that at DTU we believe that every engineering graduate will meet the need to innovate in their future career. So all of them in some way or another, we believe will be involved in innovation efforts. Uh, that's also why, why we believe it's important that they get kind of uh, trained in these, in these competences. Um, so we had a couple of starting points for this course. And those were the following. So we want engineering students to understand and experience what it takes to do innovation. So they should do more than just know the models. They should also know what to do with them and actually know what it feels like to do an innovation project. They should also kind of see the big picture of the innovation landscape and find their own position and role with, within that. So we, we don't expect all students to do innovation in the same way or in the same kind of context. We expect them to kind of find their own uh, place in that. So that was also part of this course. Um, we also want students to be able to lead or contribute to innovation initiatives in a team context. Uh, so that that's very definitely speaks to this kind of collaboration component um, that we uh, that also the, the dean addressed earlier. And then what was important for us is that we have a whole cohort of students that goes into the world with a kind of a shared signature DTU mindset and approach to innovation. So it also offers them a language. And kind of a reference point to, uh, to in relation to each other um, about innovation. Next, we also want to uh, uh, students to be able to communicate to relevant stakeholders about innovation, and this is typically something that is uh, that doesn't come natural because the way that you communicate about innovation with all of its uncertainty and complexity is quite different from typical engineering assignments that they are used to. And last, we also want the students to kind of know about and be able to use a toolkit of methods and tools for innovation. So basically, whenever they go out into the world and into their careers and they, they are involved in a project, for example, where they need to uh, do innovation, that they can kind of find the, the, the tools that they need to do this. So these were a couple of starting points that formed the basis for designing the course um, that we did. We also focus the course on a couple of core principles of innovation and collaboration. Um, so we kind of had to make choices on what do we find really core uh, and very important for the students to kind of incorporate into their overall profile and whatnot. So we had these six principles that we defined for them. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but just to kind of list them. So we want students to know um, what it means to be iterative. So not a be able to work with um, maybe open-ended assignments and kind of learning while they do the, do the work. Um, we want them to kind of learn to be creative and, and know how to kind of 
work with that in an engineering context. We want students to be relevant, or in other words, we want them to focus on more than just, for example, technical feasibility, but also think about desirability, what, what might be something that people would want to, uh, to work with. Viability in terms of business viability, responsibility, um, and sustainability. Next, we also want students to kind of be at ease with the innovation process and the uncertainty that is part of it. We want them to be inclusive and be able to incorporate other perspectives into the team that they work in um, and to be inquisitive and kind of use the knowledge that they have from their own discipline and bring it to uh, kind of into play in an innovation context. So let me kind of go into what the course was about and how it was structured. Um, so as I said, this was a central course um, that was mandatory for all of the master's students at DTU. Um, we kind of structured it in two big parts. One, which we call the boost, uh, which was very much um, focused on getting all those students with all of their different backgrounds and expectations around innovation a little bit more on the same page and kind of with a little bit more shared understanding of what we mean by innovation um, and what we're going to expect from them in this course. And then we had a two week uh, project based um, module, which is called the experience module, where they really experience being in an innovation project. Um, so that's kind of the structure that we had. Another key feature, and I'll come back to that in a bit, is that we, we know that, that some of the students at DTU, uh, and I'm sure that's the case in, uh, in your universities as well, they already have innovation competencies. So we actually created a similar or a, a, a sister course to the, the main innovation in engineering course for those that already had these innovation competencies. And their task was to facilitate a team of, let's say, novice innovators during this whole uh, project. So we had kind of two distinct courses with two sets of learning objectives, um, it, and we kind of taught them as an integrated whole. So that resulted in this kind of um, situation where we, we created teams in the course that, where we had a number of students that were novice in terms of innovation competencies, and then one expert innovator as part of that team that could help the rest of the team um, go through that process. So that was kind of the structure that we had uh, for this course, uh, which is probably one of the features that worked uh, really well and, and that worked really well in uh, getting this to work because it means that every team in the course has somebody close by that knows what, what the students are supposed to be doing and can help whenever they kind of get stuck in this innovation context. Um, another feature of the course is that we saw the need to both teach kind of foundational competencies that are generic for all of the students, but also then help students to incorporate what they've learned into their own kind of disciplinary uh, ways of working. So what this meant is that every student needs to take this uh, uh, general course um, that is five ECTS, and then within their own program, they have to define for themselves how they would like to specialize with taking into account these innovation competencies in a course in their own program. So they had to take an additional five ECTS, uh, also focused on innovation, but within their own discipline. So what we did is in this course is we very much adopted a project-based uh, logic. So we, we said we want to have the students really go through a full innovation process in a period of two weeks um, where they can kind of learn about how to do that, but also really experience what it means to do it, and especially to experience and learn how to do that in a team with people that are different from you. Um, so we took them through this kind of process that is on the slide right now, where we spend some time with the students uh, identifying what is actually the innovation challenge that we should solve. So this meant that they had to challenge uh, the, the brief that they received and that they had to kind of explore uh, within that and do research on what is really the problem here, what is really something that is worth solving. Only when they did kind of that, when they defined their own innovation challenge, they went into this solution space where they were developing solutions, testing and iterating them um, in a couple of cycles, and then also at the end of the course, pitching this to a, to a broader audience uh, and learning about how to do that and how to communicate. As part of this uh, course, we also thought it was very important that the students felt that this was real. Um, so what that meant is that we invited innovation partners into the course that offered innovation themes. 
Um, so these are real life organizations, for example, from the maritime industry um, or from uh, uh, retail industry that were all kind of focusing on different aspects um, uh, across this kind of innovation landscape that you see here on the slide. So some of these challenges are very much um, entrepreneurial. Some of them are maybe more in the public domain. And this meant that students could also choose where in that landscape they wanted to uh, work. It also meant that we could offer them something that really was uh, real, uh, where they were really working with actual innovation challenges that these organizations uh, were struggling with. As part of that, um, we also wanted to make sure that the students fed back what they worked on to those organizations. And for this, we organized kind of a pitching event where all of the teams were pitching uh, their ideas uh, to uh, these clients that they've been working for, um, but also to each other. And this is something that because of the scale, we had to do um, in, in a slightly different way than you would normally think. So we actually facilitated this whole pitching event online using uh, uh, mirror boards, using different ways of, of gathering feedback uh, for the students. For example, by asking all of the participants in the course to help assess and give feedback to all of the pitches that the students uh, were delivering during this day. Um, as in, in this way, we could also make sure that the students have to kind of a rounded experience where they started with exploring what could be an innovation challenge. They defined a challenge for themselves, they developed a solution, and then they also had to pitch it and got feedback on that pitch, um, both from their fellow students, from staff, and from the innovation partners that we invited into the course. So that was very important for us that the students really felt that. Um, next, I would just like to quickly address on uh, the way or kind of talk about the way that we developed this course, which was uh, quite uh, unique or at least different than I was used to uh, developing courses so far. So what we did in this course is we, we really wanted to take an approach where we practiced the things that we also preach in the course. So we took an innovation approach to develop this course. Um, it was very iterative. Uh, where we took into perspectives of all of the different stakeholders that would be part of the course, uh, the teachers, the students, the innovation partners, and so on. Um, as part of that process, we also involved the students in developing the course, all the way from um, the concept of the course to developing the course material, testing the course material, piloting the course, and so on. So that, that the students have been part of the course development all the way through, which uh, was not only very interesting and rewarding for us, but also just provided a lot of valuable feedback, making sure that the course would fit uh, students' expectations um, as best as we could. To do that, we also kind of put together a, a, a governance structure and a team structure where we worked with uh, a steering committee that oversaw the whole development, a core development team that was doing the development of the, the course, a team of students that was helping us with producing a lot of the course material, um, a sounding board of students and staff that would give us feedback on the course material that we were developing so that we could fine tune and improve it before we would actually put it into the course itself. Um, and then also a testing team at the end, towards the end of the course where we would first pilot the course, iterate and fine tune it a little bit more before we would actually deliver it uh, in real life. So you might be able to kind of see some of the features of an innovation process um, that in, in our case looked like this. So we, instead of kind of having a stage gate process, um, we were very trying to be very agile, developing material in sprints, uh, getting feedback from students and staff on the material, improving it and so on, uh, until we kind of developed the full course that we then tested and ran for the first time um, about a year ago. So that was, as a process also, I think it was quite interesting to to develop and try out uh, and to really find ways of involving students throughout the, the process. Um, so thank you very much for, for that. I hope that was insightful um, and that you got some insights. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions perhaps later on. Thank you, Jaap. Um, the next speaker we have is a colleague of Jaap's, uh, also uh, associate professor, uh, assistant, Assistant Professor, but at the same division at DTU Management, the Division for Responsible Innovation and Design. 
And Monadvi will um, actually take us into the real life uh, of uh, how you teach a course on innovation for students at a technical university. The floor is yours. So thank you very much for having me here. So as you can see from the title, I've called this science, technology, and fluff. And I want to talk about a little bit about why I've called this, uh, this, this title. So when industries talk about what competencies they would like to see in engineers, the top ones, in addition to the technical skills, happen to be this, the so-called soft skills. So things like being able to communicate effectively or collaborate across disciplines and uh, work in cross-cultural teams. What is interesting to note in the survey uh, that was run is that what is not in the list of competencies is critical thinking. And so uh, in my, uh, from my disciplinary perspective, which is science and technology studies, critical thinking for engineers is uh, quite an important competency to have, but often uh, we've heard of it, especially at DTU labeled as fluff as all the fluffy things that are quite difficult for engineers to grasp and, and, and talk about, even though when pushed and, um, and taught, they can do so. So this kind of critical thinking um, from the perspectives of science and technology studies is quite integral to uh, thinking about uh, responsible technologies. Uh, I was in a, a a talk the other day and the, from the Danish Design Center, uh, Christian Besson, he is the CEO of the DDC. He was talking about uh, Silicon Valley and how Silicon Valley, uh, even though it might present itself to be the savior of all the wicked problems we face today, is trying to fall, it seems like it's a coming short in many ways. And so what kind of innovation that needs to happen to try to think of all of the problems that we face today, whether it's climate change or poverty or ecological degradation, resource scarcity, war, all of these really uh, serious uh, grave problems we face is perhaps not something that only Silicon Valley or other kinds of um, these kinds of entrepreneurial mindsets can change. But what might be required is thinking about critically about what these problems are. And you can tell that from the kinds of controversies that have emerged in the past few years, whether it's over artificial intelligence and information technology, biotechnology, it's shown us that we need to have better understandings of these fluffy and complicated societal issues that perhaps can make us uh, reside in a space of discomfort. So technology, of course, has a place as does good policy, but to try to make this responsible uh, we need this critical thinking skills. And so what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to talk about some of the experiences I've had and some of the failures, which I'll start with, and the successes, cautious successes, in trying to do so um, at the Technical University of Denmark. So the first course I'll talk about is a mandatory course that all uh, undergraduate engineers have to take, which is called the Theory of Science in Engineering course. Uh, it's basically a course that is trying to educate engineers about a theory in, of, of knowledge of how uh, we know about the things that uh, we're being taught in engineering. And so again, I'm in the scholar of the field of science and technology studies. And this field uh, examines the social and political uh, dimensions of science and tech. And as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, I'm an American and I was trained in American universities. And uh, I also have experience teaching in Singapore to both um, uh, non-scientists and engineers and engineers there too. And when I came to DTU, I brought some of this experience here. And so I'll talk about what uh, perhaps did work and did not work in uh, the DTU context. So in the United States, ethics have always been front and center in all aspects of scientific and technical higher education. If you have any experience working in the United States, you know that you have to undergo ethics training that can be quite onerous, but often there is a uh, tutorial that you have to take. And in that, there's usually the, uh, the same examples such as the Nuremberg trials and experimenting on vulnerable subjects 
uh, as well as uh, the Tuskegee syphilis you know, um, uh, case where uh, uh, black airmen were infected with the syphilis uh, virus to see how it would progress. So this, of course, ethics in the United States is a product of American history in many ways. But in, in the engineering field, you see ethics as being uh, woven into the fabric of many programs there too. So it goes from uh, talking about professional ethics, so making sure that a bridge that is built does not, uh, that, it, that it's up to code and does not collapse, everything from that to the you know, uh, institutional and professional personal context to the broader societal role. So thinking about perhaps uncomfortable subjects uh, such as sexism or racism and issues like um, bias and AI and how um, you know, car manufacturers have designed cars to fit uh, male ideal models and not women, things like that. So all of that gets wrapped up. That's in the American context. So in Denmark, from what we've observed, it's quite, um, it's a very high trust society here. And ethics is implicit. My colleague will be talking more about that later on. So how to talk about ethics and broader societal concerns uh, to Danish engineers, um, it was something that I was struggling with when I came here, especially when so many of them have not taken a social science course. So what I tried to do initially was, of course, to try to create entertaining, informative lectures to supplement their reading. It was a really a teacher-centered approach. And so I would talk about things like in looking at the history of science and technology to not include the, uh, the men that we know to be quite um, instrumental and central in this history, such as Einstein and Galileo and people like that, but also uh, figures who may have been hidden. So women and minorities, right? Uh, who were also very much involved in technological and scientific discoveries. And I drew on a lot of examples from uh, science and technology studies and development studies uh, to teach engineers about things like who is considered an innovator. This is mainly from an international development perspective. So for example, you know, uh, how a, a solar cook stove in, um, in, in Tanzania that has been developed by Western engineers may not be that useful there because it doesn't fit the local context. So how do engineers envision and imagine a user and incorporate their kinds of concerns? I would talk about things like um, uh, perspectives from in indigenous uh, communities' perspectives. So, for example, you know how indigenous communities have critiqued Elon Musk's Starlink project, which is supposed to bring um, the internet to remote areas, but how this might um, conflict with uh, dark sky uh, uh, ideas of you know you need to be able to see the stars to practice your own cosmology, or how the internet might also bring in new ways of human trafficking, which is something that many communities um, in, in Canada, indigenous communities uh, suffer from. So all of these kinds of different perspectives is what I had tried to do. What I discovered, and this again is a quite, um, I would say a perspective that worked in the American context, perhaps it worked in the Singaporean context, but not so much here. What I found is that because it was so teacher-centered, uh, it was some, some students really gravitated to it and found it quite interesting, but others were put off by it because it seemed too in your face and too, um, perhaps they thought of it as uh, the engineering school is not a place to talk about these kinds of things. But in some level, these are the very people I wanted to reach. These are the very people who I did not want to be put off. So, now I'm going to talk about some cautious successes of how that changed a little bit. And this is through a class called Design Thinking and Sociotechnical Implications. It's a class that I co-teach with the previous speaker, um, Yap. And here, uh, this takes on very much not a teacher-centered approach, but very much a student-centered approach. And what I particularly want to talk about here is a social implications design method. So, and how this method has helped students uh, think about the world 
uh, a little bit more critically and uh, think about themselves perhaps and their blind spots a little bit more critically. And it's a way to help them get to the same place where I wanted them to go, but perhaps in a way that was uh, more student driven and allowed them to experience it for themselves. And so these design methodologies actually help designers and engineers create more societally responsible and responsive solutions to a point. And so this is what I want to talk about, the social implications design method. Now, this methodology um, is very different from what engineers typically learn. Um, they usually learn how to design and produce solutions to the spec, right? This is a this is a very problem-centered or solutions, solutionist approach is how, how we call it, where the problem is already pretty well-defined. It's been given by a client. So there's no need to challenge or question the problem framing, but rather it's about finding the solution. But what this method does is turn that on its head, where now uh, students have to discover what a good problem is on their own. They have to figure out what is a problem worth tackling, how they can align their own personal values to a particular kind of problem. And this takes time. And it takes not just looking at um, engineering you know, papers, or it requires actually delving into a wide variety of literature and research and inputs. These are called context factors. So everything from documentary, say if they're looking at sustainable food, you know, they might watch a documentary about factory farming. Um, they might uh, read, uh, look at art. They might read social studies and ethnographic works on uh, what it is to be in a slaughterhouse. They have to really build up a fuller picture, a more robust picture of what this world is. And this is what they, and, and this kind of thinking is um, quite important for them to narrow down eventually on what their, uh, how their, what their problem statement is going to be and what they're going to do with it. So in some sense, the intervention doesn't have to be a technology. It can easily be uh, a policy if they want to, or something entirely different. But still, the fact that they have ownership over the problem actually gets them to some of the things that we want them to develop competencies in, not just collaboration or communication or interdisciplinary work, but also critical thinking, because through the point, through their uh, conversations with one another, they often discover things like, actually, sustainability means quite different, different, different to each of them. One person might think of sustainable food consumption as veganism, while another might think of it as, you know, ethical labor practices, while another might think of it as supporting local farmers, while another might think of it as ethical meat consumption. It could be all quite different. So. In the evaluations, although they are thrown into the wilderness at the very beginning, they often say this is too fluffy, I don't know what to grasp onto. At the end, they have a grudging respect for the method and they can understand how they have um, learned something through this process and learned how to be critical. Of course, there are some, you know, I think there are some areas of improvement. One of the things is that in, in DTQ, the sustainable development goals, which as you may know, have been drawn from the millennium development goals, which were targeted at people in the global South. It's hard for that provides the overarching ethical framework. This is something my colleague will talk about, but it's hard for people to, for students to localize it to their particular context. And so they often have this myopic view that perhaps Denmark has already reached you know, a certain level and all other societies need to catch up in some way and maybe they're exoticized. And it also, because the course substructure helps them, it funnels them towards localized problems and perhaps not globalized kinds of issues as much because it's quite difficult to you know, get stakeholders living elsewhere. The second issue is the point of intervention. Often we focus on users, right? But this method actually allows people to focus on anyone. One could easily think about policymakers or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or politicians. You can think of other people who might be the target of, your, um, of, of the, this innovation. So rather than fluff, I'll just end with this. I think of it not so much of this cottony, silky, 
fluff, but rather fluff that's perhaps embedded with glass shards, you know, where it can, it should cut you a little bit, should make you uncomfortable. And it's something that one has to grapple with on a, a both a personal and a professional level. But this is the kind of uncomfortable growth that we try to make happen that needs to happen if we want to see solutions to the kind of wicked problems we face in the world today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Monami. This was indeed very uh, interesting and hopefully food for thought for all of you. Our next speaker is also a colleague of Yaps and Monami from the same division of Responsible uh, Innovation and Design at DTU Management. Uh, Corinna Foll is a research assistant uh, also in our sister project to Eurotech, which is called Eurotech Boost, and it's a research leg of this project. And uh, she will talk to you more about the findings she's done in her research. Yes. Hello, everyone. This is the same time. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karina Fa. I am yes, research assistant in the sister project of Eurotech. So I have uh, been working with the Eurotech University since 2021. So I have some experiences from on the ground. Um, and my background is in techno anthropology. So I have an anthropological perspective and anthropologists love context. So I will talk about uh, Munich and Copenhagen on competencies and context. And I would have loved to talk about all universities, um, but since I have 10 minutes, I kind of had to pick. Um, and I decided on yeah, DTU since I'm located here. And then having a look at TUM Technical uh, University of Munich, um, because that's just where I know the national context the best. Um, and if we make um, comparisons, and, and I was uh, invited to kind of bring this comparative aspect uh, to competencies uh, today. And if we make such um, comparisons, there's of course always a bit the difficulty that the human mind wants to think one is better or worse, but that's really, um, that's kind of the no-go for anthropologists. So you, um, you, you should not think of it as saying one is better or worse, but I want to show um, two examples of how universities approach competences differently in order for us to better understand each other's kind of national educational context. Like we, we have different starting points that we need to bring into the discussion. And first of all, the reminder, we, we've heard some of these uh, words uh, during today, right? So um, besides the technical skills, um, engineers, are required to be good in responsible innovation. So um, Yap has talked about this earlier, it's innovation, but also with a focus on how do we actually create something that responds to a societal need. Um, engineers should be good communicators and uh, collaborators. So suddenly you kind of have to, have to do it all. Um, and when I digged into that, I realized this is, this is like a really nice dream, right? There's a direction to go. But I was interested in how do we do it differently? I kind of thought there are some, um, yeah, just different contexts that we need to take into consideration. So I'm using um, the example of ethics and soft skill courses to exemplify how we educate differently um, relating to responsible innovation, collaboration, and communication. So first on ethics courses. Um, let's go to two. Last semester, there were more than 30 courses offered at two, uh, which have ethics in the title, both uh, German and English. And that's, that's quite a lot, right? I mean, it's a big university, but there seems to be really a space for talking about ethics. Uh, courses deal, for instance, with like data law and ethics, um, historical misuse of information services, also dealing with surveillance from private and public institutions. Um, ethical and unethical human technology interaction in like this um, intergenerational aspect as well. And there is this recurring tension field made very explicit between technological progress on the one hand and the negative uh, consequences on the other hand that you kind of need to navigate as an engineer. And then 
students are invited into the discussion on the philosophical and ethical practical reflections um, to bring in this critical value dimension um, and, and potential misuse of technology. How does that look like at DTU? Um, Currently, there are three courses offered at DTU that have ethics uh, in the title. And of course, the universities are also different in size, but other contextual aspects are also relevant. So if we look at those three ethics courses, they're pretty hands-on. So if we start with the user, it's safe. Um, or if we have the right model to calculate risk, then it's safe. And looking at DTU and, and other courses also on a bit more of meta level, we see this tacit implication that engineers are very much trusted to be doing good for society. And the app, uh, SDGs, as, as Monami mentioned earlier, they're like this, this other, a little bit abstract aspect perhaps that comes in here. And all of this makes a lot of sense if we look at DTU from a more socio-political perspective that I'm interested in. So, DTU is a traditional Danish university and it's located in a high trust society, right? And what does that mean? Denmark is known for the strong bonds between the state and the citizens. So engineers also kind of act within this framework of mutual responsibility. They're very much trusted, but also trusting to be on the right path. And there's perhaps um, just a little bit less of this sense of urgency to potentially, um, yeah, that you need to be critical in a high trust society, right? And there are also now when we look to TUM, there are also reasons why it looks different at TUM. So Germany with a very different historical background. As Gary Dowie, um, professor specialized on, in um, engineering education, he works, uh, worked at Virginia Tech, writes, um, the German engineering profession, profession underwent a very big transformation after World War II. So shortly after all those atrocities, powerful German engineering um, organizations came together with philosophers to problematize this, yeah, the practices of German engineers, right? And ethics became an important field here to reflect on engineers' responsibility towards the whole of humanity, basically and um, bringing in this aspect that tech can easily be misused. So this shows how our national and historical context very much shapes how we interpret and teach responsibility and responsible innovation as well. Now, um, let's jump to soft skills. That's another example, um, because I wondered how do we educate so-called soft skills like communication, collaboration differently? Is that just the same or do we, uh, yeah, what differences can we see there? So if I were a student at TUM um, and I want to get better at communication, of course, there are many ways uh, that, yeah, where, how you can train communication, but there's a centralized institution where you can go to. So I would probably go to TUM's Center for Key Competences, right? There are workshops and courses on team building, uh, conflict resolution, diversity, intercultural um, training, leadership, and so on. So it's kind of outsourced for someone to take care of these things. So we see that university thinks that this is, these are very desirable competences to have, but we implicitly see that it's kind of perceived as a deficit. So students are not quite that good in team building and should be, should be pushed to make it a little bit better. And for many, it is actually the first time to have uh, such an explicit offer to, to, to get trained in such skills. At DTU, again, things work differently. So there is no center for key competences, for instance, um, and that also for a reason. And I was actually um, yeah, consulting my Danish colleagues about that, and, and I asked, how would you feel about doing a team building course? Yeah, And one of them was like, oh my God, I've had enough of that in my life. And the other one was just yeah, laughing at me. And I don't know, I, I had the impression maybe it was a bit crossing the boundary. Like, what, what do you want to tell me? Um, so it seems to be a topic where it's a bit the assumption that we've kind of figured it out. I, I, I don't really want to take another team building course. I've, I've had enough of that in my life. Um, and to contextualize that also again, um, yeah, the Danish education system very much builds on collaboration from day one, right? So collaboration understood as group work with your uh, yeah, classmates, basically. 
and that's on the agenda since since very early on. So understandably, starting university for um, I don't know 18, 20, 19 year old, there's maybe little interest to be like, yeah, now I really need to learn team building. So we have quite different points of departure here, here how we address and take care of, um, of those things such as, as communication and also what we understand uh, as good communication, right? Um, if we think we master it, if it's, a, if it's a deficit or if it's group work, if it's, a, if it's aspects of diversity and so on. So what does all of that mean for future competencies? Um, we have this shared dream and, but we have different contexts and different futures. So the shared ambition is there for, therefore we're here, right? We want to um, encourage the Eurotech universities to be on this kind of path together. Um, but context really matters how we perform the competencies. So for me, a little bit the underlying competency for the future, and it also relates to what we've heard earlier, is this ability to reflect on our own assumptions and starting points and, and upbringing, like in which context have I come to think things are like that or that. For instance, if we think about what do I think does good communication look like, or what do I think a responsible engineer look like? Um, or like, why am I critical or, or complicit with technological progress? Um, which cultural practices and narratives have also brought me to think I can trust, I don't know, uh, data or uh, like data, certain services where my data is being treated, you know? Um, so there are a lot of things that we, I think we should reflect upon. And especially um, if we think about the big topics of our time, right? Like. Um, we have to tackle climate change rather today than tomorrow, and we need to build resilient and green uh, energy infrastructures. So we will we will have to work even more together and across countries. And therefore, the Eurotech universities are also such a great opportunity for us to to practice those collaboration skills. And I just hope that for all of our collaborations, and if you're a student or a staff member, we can keep these aspects in mind. Like keep in mind how our different contexts shape what matters for us and how other contexts also uh, make people think other things matter for them. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Corinna. Uh, yet another very, very a good uh, presentation uh, that gives a lot of food for thought. We have um, one more speaker for you in this panel. I'm very happy to introduce to you a student representative. Um, we have with us today uh, Abubakar Ali from our student union, um, Polytechnic for Evening. And I'll give the floor to you. Uh, Abu, please uh, take it away. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, first of all, my name is Abu Bakir, and as said previously, I am a student at DDU. I'm a bachelor student, and in my last year, as well as a member of PF as a PF board, as well as the student uh, board for Eurotech as well. So, I guess an understanding of both DDU as well as the aims and wishes of Eurotech moving forward. Yeah. So. Um, I've mostly thought about these slides as well as the presentation, trying to explain what us as students want and why and how we would want these soft skills, which we understand as well to be important, incorporated in our education. First of all, uh, if you go back to what engineering fundamentally is, uh, it is applying science as well as math, as well as other competences to solve problems of today. And as mentioned, uh, by the speaker just before me, the problems of right now are many, including climate change, poverty, and stuff like that. So we need to be able to solve them as soon as possible. And the, these soft skills uh, allow us to use our technical abilities better and make us uh, interact effectively and, and coordinate better. And hence, they're important for work as well as any other thing where we can use them. And uh, for example, the examples of the soft skills that I had listed was communication, teamwork, having being flexible and adaptive to the surrounding, as well as um, for us, 
it's important to realize that while some people believe these soft skills are inherent and they can't really improve them, like if they're bad in communication, they can't really improve that. That isn't in, uh, what has been uh, found out because these soft skills can be developed through both inside class learning as well as through courses and webinars and workshops as well. And uh, the reason for making sure that we take these soft skills is making sure that us engineers moving from DTU, going to the real world or the job market world, that we are valuable and we can stand out. Because as mentioned before, uh, employers have increasingly said that uh, these soft skills are something they look for for engineers in the future. And hence, uh, by having them, they can uh, students can improve their job prospects as well as future career success. If you look at the 24 competences, I've put, uh, taken a few of them uh, to dive deep into and then explain. For uh, I've looking at communication, the collaboration, uh, communication, which is number one, collaboration, which is number two, as well as 18, which is management. And there's a few of them which are hard skills, uh, so I didn't really talk about them. If you think about uh, communication, communication is an important skill to make sure that people listen and uh, communicate as well as making sure that they can work in a team environment, which was emphasized by my previous speaker as well, as well as making sure that for engineers, they can act to the outside world as well. Because while we work in teams of engineers, we also work with people who do not have all the knowledge or background as us. So making sure that we can uh, talk to people without those knowledge in a sense in future would be client relationships as well. As well as in terms of communication, leadership skills are important as well because many um, engineers of today become leaders of tomorrow, leading companies. So it's important that we know how to communicate to people beneath us uh, and making sure we can motivate them as well as provide direction and guidance so that projects go smoothly. As well as the last thing which I would really want to emphasize on would be language because communication is only possible if people can both understand each other. And when we think about Eurotech, which spans across the European continent, there's countries where language skills of English might be better. Some people who, uh, use local languages much more. So it's important that we are able to understand each other and hence language skills are important in that regard. As well as culture as well in terms of uh, different countries. When we go to collaboration and management, it's an, uh, in terms of collaboration, it's important to have diversity of perspective because the, as mentioned before, the problems are huge and we can only solve them with complex uh, solutions and innovative solutions. And we can't keep the innovation to a particular segment of the population. And hence, we need to make sure that we work across uh, different demographics to make sure that the solutions can be realistic and be implementable. So hence, it's important to have this diversity of thought. And that could be only possible if we have these uh, collaboration skills. And then in terms of efficiency, it's important as well to make sure that we know how to divide ourselves and able to manage the team so we can spend less time on the particular task as well as making sure that we get time to rest and stuff like that as well as we all know burnout and making sure stress is pretty high these days as well as making sure that we do problem solving and conflict management. Because when we work in teams, we would all know that sometimes it doesn't go smoothly. So we need to make sure that we solve those problems that come up and some of us know how to handle them while without getting personal as well as getting making emotional runs high, which end up negatively affecting the projects themselves. Then comes resource management. Many things in life are, uh, limited in quantity, hence we need to make sure that we maximize and make sure we are as effective as possible. Time would be one thing, materials, budget, stuff like that. Make sure that we are effective with our budgets. We need to get those skills as well. And now on um, implementation strategies that I thought about. Uh, while uh, DTU does a great job of making sure that we have courses which specifically focuses on these soft skills. It doesn't really solve the problem because those courses kind of act in silos. 
So it's important for us to make sure that this knowledge is implemented throughout all courses in a sense, so that students can do not inherently only need to take particular courses to get these knowledge, however, get to implement it throughout the classwork. And I think uh, group-based learning is a good way of doing that. Then an important thing is recognizing outside class learning, coming from PF myself, uh, clubs and societies are a great way to get these skills as well as practice and develop their skills further. And it would be really nice if schools like DTU could recognize the time that students put outside their class to develop themselves, uh, whether it being giving credits, uh, uh, giving extra points when students go to exchange, perhaps even recognizing them as courses, stuff like that. So students spending time and developing themselves isn't negatively affecting them because they aren't able to spend as much time on their education. Then it's, it's also to making sure that there are soft skill courses and soft skill courses uh, have, are of a wide range. And especially in case of DTU, it would be really nice if DTU could either provide Danish language courses, which other universities in Eurotech do a great job in, as well, or perhaps recognize Danish language courses that students take otherwise, to make sure that students, when spending their time on it and developing themselves, isn't uh, looked upon as wasting time and not being able to study at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so now we could move on to the question answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abubakar. You can actually stay here. Okay. Um, I would like to invite the other speakers, uh, Yap and Monami and Corinna, to come up here and join us. Um, let me just step a little bit aside so we can have the four speakers in the center. I think there's space for all of you. Maybe you need to yeah. come oh, a little bit fine. into the center and I'll stand here. Okay, so thank you so much for all of your presentations. I think, to be honest, now having been a project leader uh, on this uh, work package where we had to develop uh, the future competences of the engineer and look at what competences are actually demanded by the industry and by society, I think all of your presentations really exemplified it very well, what it is we are trying to do in Eurotech. So thank you so much for that. I have a few questions here already, but I would actually like perhaps with you, Jan, to ask, uh, you were telling me about how you were trying to actually apply what the talk to when you developed the course. Yep. Can you tell me more about what you think, maybe in terms of from a staff perspective, uh, what, staff in a technical university, not just professors, but maybe also research assistants and others who are actually contributing to, um, to the whole learning experience, how maybe also the 21st century skills could be applied more in the way you work with developing courses. Um, just, so you, what, what you would like to hear is that how, how we could use, kind of involve, more stakeholders into this development? Yeah, I'm also thinking maybe more a perspective as, as teaching at a university. Yeah. Do you think also to be self-reflective? Right. Yeah, as a yeah. professor, as yes. researchers, as teachers yeah. in a technical university. Um, what is uh, your view on how far we still have to go right. now you have developed a course like this? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And maybe where I'd like to start is saying that while we were developing this course, uh, we also realized that perhaps what we need to do next is develop a course for teachers and staff connected to this uh, so that we also give um, academic staff the opportunity to, to also experience the same kinds of competencies and the same kind of teaching that comes with this, uh, this type of course. Um, we did experience that, that often, um, the kind of format that we have, the kind of experience that we want to give students in terms of uh, how they learn is quite different from many courses, let's say more conventional courses and more conventional teaching formats. Um, so that's definitely, I think, one of the insights that we had. Uh, we also realized that quite a few of the staff that were in the project when we were developing the course were quite keen to just also see how we were developing it. Uh, and we're just following along, even though they had didn't have to be there anymore. They were just keen on seeing, okay, how, how, 
how do you work with these kind of uh, uh, teaching these kind of competences in this kind of format? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was actually what I was uh, interested <laughs> in because yeah. also in Europe, take one of the next steps that we will be doing is actually also looking to how we design courses, competence development for staff at right. universities. So that's, thank you very much. Um, I would like to move on with a couple of questions then. Let's uh, begin with you, uh, Mon Ami. You were talking a lot about how you actually uh, address uh, some of uh, the competences with students in a technical university that are perhaps not the knowledge, skills, and competences that you think of as a student when you normally apply and go to a technical university. And we can maybe have Apu comment on it afterwards as well. But um, something about how have you actually gone about addressing some of these more, what can you say, difficult uh, questions with the students of being in a mode where you reflect, both self-reflect and also reflect on how you interact with other students, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things to be aware of is that the professor doesn't know everything, right? And the professor who may be in a very um, hierarchical position of authority has a lot to learn from the students. So I think what is important is to try to engage in dialogue about these kinds of issues and to make it not teacher-centered, which is you know, what I had been trained to do, but is actually UDTU uh, here and in, in, in DTU that I um, learned the value of students going on these journeys with the professor together through coaching and facilitation sessions that are um, so students make discoveries on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very important that there should be a guide there, mm -hmm. but um, to, to recognize that, you know, these are conversations and ongoing dialogues that we need to have rather than I am expounding from on high. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I just made a mistake. Someone pointed it out about the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the Tuskegee Airmen as someone had pointed out, but rather um, poor sharecroppers who were the subject of the study. So mm -hmm. people make mistakes, you know, and I misspoke, but, but these kinds of things have to be um, talked about mm -hmm. because without discussion and without some form of um, mutual vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know, then this is not, um, th then you don't have any kind of transformative aspect mm. and learning of these kinds of um, difficult issues mm. that always accompany technology. Technology is not developed in a vacuum, but is very messy and always Im implicated in societal mm. concerns. So I think that's really, um, so my job as a teacher is to try to facilitate those conversations and perhaps guide it, mm. but um, recognize that I don't have all of the answers. And I think that maybe could lead us also to the next question of other messy things mm -hmm. uh, in learning. So Abu, you actually brought up, it can be very hard actually to work in a team when you have a given assignment, but still uh, we are humans and things happen when you have to work together where it can be emotional, it can be, be social, it can be mental. Uh, you were also mentioning yourself, I thought very interestingly, uh, how do we actually also for students address the issues of uh, so-called work-life balance? Um, and I think it could be interesting to hear from you, Abu, also. Um, do you think that uh, your uh, learning journey here at DTU could also have more, what do you say, emphasis on the, the university actually guiding you as students and how do you actually manage your student life? Uh, how do you work together in teams? How do you, in general, address more of these topics that, that are of a, a personal, social uh, nature? I think, uh, at least in my experience, like it's easier if these journeys or these questions or these is done when students themselves choose courses and uh, want to seek knowledge on it and register themselves. 
the uh, the harsh thing or the bad climate that happens sometimes is when these courses become mandatory in a sense mm-hmm. and while five of them might really be interested and want to develop themselves the other five people in their group would be just there thinking it's a, like you need to take this course so I'm, I'm here just for the credits or just to pass in a sense so that doesn't really help the journey so I think make for questions and self-reflection as well as make it's really vital but I think you need buy-in from the person as well mm. it's hard to force those courses on any student mm. and I think that's pretty much well reflected on how I guess universities like TTU or students sometimes think these courses to be fluff because it might be fluff for them right now because they haven't experienced stress yeah. but when they experience stress that might be the most important thing so I think we need to take that into account that we make it more flexible so students can make the journey for themselves and answer the questions they're facing in life right now. Mm-hmm. Because when you aren't really facing it, it's hard to relate and see the importance of it. Yeah. So I think that's something that could be worked on. But other than that, I think we, it's hard to incorporate them in regular class as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the real problem comes that it's easy for us to take a course where they tell us about self-management, taking time for yourself, but you end up being here until eight o'clock. It's time to yeah. do some project before the exam week and stuff like that. It's it's important that we walk the talk in that sense and yeah. make sure it's actually an environment that we teach mm-hmm. to be. Yeah. So do you think actually that what Corinna was telling us about how at the TUM in Munich, that they actually have a competence center where students can actually go specifically to train certain competences. Uh, what, what do you think about that compared to how it works here at DTU? I think if it's a choice by the students and them signing up in, for example, the skills that they think that it's most relevant for them, I think that's the much better way of doing it. Because right now, I don't think it's, it really facilitates much because it f- doesn't facilitate it for the students who are there for the learning mm. because the, or the half of you, because in a sense, there is like social bias in the sense if a, you tend to stick with the larger group, not to okay. point, uh, like be the awkward one in that mm. situation. Hence, it doesn't really facilitate much. Mm. So I think that method of there would be many classes and students then choosing what they think is the most relevant for them mm. seems like a better way of doing I think it was interesting. Uh, I just wanted to follow up briefly because I thought actually what uh, Corinna was telling us about the differences between the whole history of the engineering uh, studies, uh, the modern uh, uh, education of, of engineers in Germany versus in Denmark. I thought that was very interesting for us to reflect on. So I was just thinking maybe given what has been said here now, I don't know if you want to say a few more words about how those different uh, traditions uh, actually uh, come to play, um, but maybe also how it could be relevant for Eurotech to look mm-hmm. at in going forward with our project. I mean, what I see is an interesting tension, right? Because there is this idea of um, mainstreaming innovation, and that also has a reason, right? Because mm-hmm. it, um, yeah, it is the idea of DTU to, I mean, it is very much ingrained, I would also say, in Danish society to build on innovation as a kind of central strategy forward, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of where the workforce and the work industry is leading, um, also yeah, out of historical reasons. Um, so I think there that's also like there is a reason f- like why we heard um, all this effort being put into making in innovation engineering, for instance, like a, a course for everyone. And then at the same time of like seeing that there is some, um, yeah, perhaps challenges on the way, I would, I would say that's perhaps, um, yeah, plays into this dialectic that we're, uh, I don't know, always in conversation between what does, we as a university, for instance, want and what are other voices to bring in. So yeah, I think that's how, yeah, what I could say about it. I have a few uh, comments from our participants mm-hmm. and I would like to, I think I will just read both of them actually. And then, then I think you could uh, signal if, if you would like to comment on them. Um, the first one uh, is, is a question uh, 
are we ready to teach these future competences? That's a short question, but then a comment. Our staff are professionals in their own field. Effective teaching might be difficult for them since they might not have training in teaching some of the soft skills we've been talking about today. And now we want to set the bar even higher and want them to become coaches and facilitators. Um, so I'm thinking maybe Yab at least, or you, one of me, you, you, maybe you have uh, something to say on that. And then I just want to say uh, the other um, comment we had. Might it be enlightening to interview graduated students one year, five years, and 10 years after they have entered the job market? The corporate culture shock and how newly hired and seasoned employees experience it and adapt to it might provide useful insights. Mm -hmm. That's also really, really interesting. Thanks for those two questions and comments. And maybe we start with you, Yap, and then you each say a little bit about that before we, um, we start to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, maybe starting with that first mm -hmm. uh, comment. Yeah. I think that was there was a couple of points there. One of the interesting things for me at least was that you know are we raising the bar maybe for students if we also ask them to start facilitating mm -hmm. uh, these kind of processes. Um, I think what is interesting at least in the in the setup that we have here at, at DTU is that only those students that already have uh, let's say the the basic competencies in in this case innovation and collaboration would be facilitators and would be kind of progressing mm -hmm. for themselves in, in that kind of learning journey. Yeah. Whereas if they're not there, that's not what they would be taught. But that's also the whole idea of having peer-to-peer -peer, yes. uh, included much more in teaching today, where you see the teacher as the facilitator of a learning yeah. space much yeah. more. Yeah. Maybe you could also just say a few things about that. Yeah, so I think, mm -hmm. and that also speaks to what one of me is yeah. saying, is that yes. we, a lot of this kind of learning uh, needs to happen together. Uh, and and we, we need to kind of acknowledge that different kind of participants in that process bring something different potentially, and that we can facilitate that. Um, so that's also what we try to do in, in, this, uh, in this case for this project. Um, of course, there's a tension field between, um, and that's, that speaks to the second point is, there's a tension field between trying to convince students uh, that certain competencies are important, even though they might not see it yet, um, which is, I think, also what you were uh, talking to, uh, is, is, there is there is always difficult. And of course, that's why we spent, for example, in this, in this new course, a lot of time on, on introducing students to this, the importance of it. But I also think that the question about interviewing alumni, mm -hmm. is that something that DTU does? Yeah. And that's also why we know that, that once alumni enter into practice, they often miss uh, these skills and, and, and they maybe didn't realize as students that they needed some of these skills and mm -hmm. that they kind of needed to maybe be uh, confronted a little bit with the importance of that. Yeah. Of course, there is always a tension field there of yeah. what is the best way of introducing students mm -hmm. to that. But I think it's, uh, it's definitely a good point to make. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, um, the only thing I wanted to add is that there in, in, in my field, science and technology, so there's something called the cognitive deficit model, mm. where you know we assume it's usually thought of as the public not understanding science enough, not understanding what photosynthesis is, and they need to be taught, yeah. right? Yeah. And there, there's been a paper that came out about the competencies of engineers as a deficit model too, mm. that now engineers have to be good at so many things and teachers also have to be good at so many things. They have to not only be technically yeah. proficient, but they have to be good communicators. You were talking about this. Yeah. They have to be sensitive, sensitive to diversity. They have to speak across cultures. They have to be this ideal type engineer. Yeah. Yeah. And similarly for um, you know, uh, the teaching staff, you have to be patient and no conflict management and know when to intervene, when to step out. And all of this comes with experience, right? And failing at first, and then trying again and trying differently. And I would say that this sort of failure process, which I think is also for, I mean, to some degree, I think there's an expectation that we want the fully formed, fully mature engineer mm. now, rather than them going into the you know, job market and then figuring things out 
I think sometimes we have that in our heads as educators that we want them to get there yeah. now, you know. But that's perhaps also why you were talking so much about creating maybe a learning space yeah. where this uh, thing of trial and error and actually just uh, testing out things like you do in design thinking methodologies where you prototype something quick, you get some feedback from some people, and then you go back to the working table. Why that is so important? It is exactly because it allows us to stay in a learning uh, context where it's not about knowing everything or knowing the solution. It's much more yeah. about finding out uh, something about what can actually become something. I'll just add one thing. I think as a student, you don't want it to, correct me if I'm wrong, but feel as if this experimental learning space is a waste of time, mm -hmm. that they don't want to be experimented on by te innovative teachers mm -hmm. who want to do good. Time. Yeah, yeah and waste their time, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think to get the buy-in, this really has to come from a lot of places of trying to explain why it's important for students to have this, how this is going to be, you know, the manage expectations is something you talked about earlier mm -hmm. about, you know, what students should expect from this process yeah. and why this is valuable in and of itself. Yeah. And yeah. I think perhaps from the student's perspective, I think it's important that we do not work in like, again, like even trying to promote innovation or soft skills, we shouldn't do it just through Eurotech. We, because even in DTU in general, we, as mentioned previously, there's the alumni people who survey the alumni, make sure that we are in check in that regard, as well as it's, there's the career hub and stuff like that who make sure that companies come out while students are studying, mm -hmm. so students can understand what skills companies need from their uh, future employees. So students hence get a chance to, when they choose electives and get to choose courses, they can specialize in those skills so they can make become more attractive for those yeah. future employees. And I think making sure that, and I think that's sometimes the failure of a university perhaps as big as uh, DTU or Eurotech in general, that yeah. things are happening across different places to make sure that everyone feeds into each other and knows what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Because many of these things would be, for example, being taught to students, for example, if they lack communication skills, they work in PF uh, and they're a part of the student council and they think, oh, I'm really struggling in that. Then they can further improve themselves because they could realistically expect if they are struggling with that in PF or another extracurricular activity, that could be the same when they enter the job market as well. Mm -hmm. So making sure that the universities allow students to develop themselves extracurricularly, yeah. as well as making sure that they have time so they can speak to companies, go mm -hmm. to these events and stuff like that. Yeah. And hence, I guess, comes things like not having evening modules and making sure students have like time to learn yeah. because outside class learning is something we're really missing on uh, when we talk about this because while we learn in class and you go to a lecture, mm -hmm. you need to practice it and see it for yourself as mm -hmm. well. That doesn't really happen in an 8 a.m. lecture. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Good point. And I think also uh, related to actually to the question, uh, this thing with when you come out to the labor market, I mean, we would want our students to be, what can you say, ready for the labor market. And if they haven't worked on company cases, if they haven't met people from the companies, if they haven't done internships or worked on a project with the company, um, which is, of course, the case in most universities, but still, we also know that it's still very much sought after by the students as well, more opportunities to get in contact with companies. I would also add that it's not just university, sorry, yeah, uh, or just, industry. We another, yeah, we have another question and we have another five minutes, two minutes. Okay, yes, uh, uh, mon ami, and then Corinna, did you have one? Okay, yeah. and then we... It's also civil society organizations which could use more representation in DTU too. Oh, definitely. And not just companies. Good point. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's really something that we should also just uh, hear on, on the very last minutes, maybe just give a little bit more emphasis because it's coming up, okay. diversity, the whole inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I saw the other question deals a little bit with like ethics. Yes, right? exactly. And, and I was actually thinking that maybe that would be you. Uh, just yeah, yeah. Should I just read it? Yeah, read yeah. It, yeah. So it says, thank you for in, an interesting talk. Thank you for being here. 
I got the impression from Mon Ami and Corina that ethics is not very explicit in Danish universities compared to others. Is it problematic or does it influence our Danish students' uh, workability abroad? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good question. Interesting question. And perhaps I cannot talk about all university in uh, like comparing all. I know that in France, it's also not so much of a, of a big deal to make ethics explicit, actually. I would probably say that that Germany is the, yeah. Because the, of the history. Obvious, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps I think for students, it could be quite interesting to just broaden a little bit the horizon, what is out there also in terms of organizations, mm -hmm. like last uh, or like two weeks ago in our division, we also had a talk from uh, um, an institute in Berlin that was dealing with ethics and uh, responsibility in technology. You know, mm -hmm. at TUM there is the, I think it's called um, Ethics in Artificial Intelligence. Uh, it's an institute. So I think just to mm -hmm. looking a little bit what is out there in yeah. terms of organizations, mm -hmm. Um, how do they deal with ethics? Um, what questions do they raise? What yeah. do they problematize? And how, yeah, I think it's very interesting to re reflect about how would I perhaps coming from Danish background answer this? How might other people answer that? And of course, also other um, NGOs um, seeing, yeah, what do they, what issues do they bring up? Yes, and if I can just uh, wrapping up, I think that's a very good cue from Corinna because actually a large part of the work we've been doing in Eurotech in this particular working group that uh, I'm running um, is actually also the issue of how do we as technical universities become more active, not just with our traditional ecosystem, so especially the big uh, companies where students are also very interested in having relations, and we are, of course, as universities, but civil society more broadly and other type of actors than we normally uh, consider our partners. So that uh, NGOs are and other type of research institutions and the whole field of philosophy, political mm -hmm. science is a theme that will be brought up by Eurotech um, in the coming four years, much more mm -hmm. in our work package four on the professional. So it's also, you know, addressing going forward with lifelong learning with what the professionals need in the companies uh, of understanding society more broadly and the political, um, geo uh, geopolitical mm -hmm. uh, uh, challenges that we face today in Europe, but certainly also how we relate maybe better to other type of actors. It could also be the Danish Design Center that mm -hmm. Monami mentioned earlier, but there are many players out there that maybe we need to get into the room with students yeah. because maybe also for, for students of engineering, it could be interesting to hear different types of actors than just engineering companies. Yeah. I think Do you have the last word, Abu? I think, I guess, for all of this to happen, I think the biggest thing that we, students need is time and mm. making sure they're, I guess, left alone so they can explore for themselves. In DTU right now, I think we usually have events during lunch, evening events as well. Perhaps like they're not as visible to all, but we try to make sure that we reach out to everyone and students can get, I guess, company experience, NGO experience as well and stuff like that. But making sure that the students get time for that, because the big reality for students here is that time is very limited mm. because things happen on top of each other and you take five courses each semester, you barely are doing the projects. Like I think making sure that students have time and flexibility to explore themselves and learn, I think, is the most important thing. Thank you so much. Uh, let us just uh, give uh, you a hand. Thank you so much, because actually, I think you really uh, helped us exemplify what Eurotech is all about. So thank you for your time. I know uh, we took a lot of your time, but it was really important. And I think I can say on behalf of my Eurotech colleagues as well, that's this was really a very uh, good way of us to try and show what it is we can do across universities. So thank you for your time. And <clears throat> let me just uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, our speakers are people that we work closely with in the project. Um, I think some of you uh, probably also have met them uh, in our project, whether it's our student representative, it's our colleague from DTU management. Um, and uh, if you're interested in diving more into their, um, um, their points, uh, you can, of course, go into uh, the slides that we have in the slide deck. 
but you're also welcome to reach out uh, to me or others in the Eurotech project and uh, we will connect you. So um, thank you very much for being here with us today and uh, hopefully see you out there uh, in the real world. Thank you.